Hello, everybody. This is Rupa Sunku. Uh, I'm a senior director with Oracle's uh, Fusion Application Product Team. I am now currently the chief evangelist at uh, Tatcha Life Foundation for the Career Help Program. Today, I have a panel uh, that uh, is going to talk about empowering yourself and uh, determining uh, your opportunities and chances by making sure you understand your self-worth. Once you have determined your self-worth and established the competencies uh, that will drive for self-improvement, you are then um, landed with a platter of opportunities and need the guidance uh, to be able to situate yourself socially and economically to face those challenges. A mentor is one uh, person who can bring and be that light and support system for you in your journey to success. Whether it is through educational help or academia or through resume optimization or being able to apply uh, for jobs in the big uh, wide world that is out there? Or is it the training of skills and specialized skills with social entrepreneurship that can uh, highlight your journey to the next level? Um, today, I have three panelists with me who have joined me to address uh, the social situation that I have just enumerated. First, I'd like you to be introduced to Manuel Serapio, he is the faculty director uh, for the Institute for International Business and Cyber and an associate professor for the Business School of University of Colorado at Denver. Welcome, Manuel. I then have Brett Tierney, who is the vice president of the recruitment product family within Oracle. And uh, welcome, Brett. And last and finally, I have uh, Shekhar Prabhakar, who is the co-founder and CEO at Hasirudala. It is a social uh, enterprise focused on creating uh, livelihoods to waste pickers through business and uh, giving importance to the impact it has on the environment. So today um, I'd like to uh, take the opportunity uh, to talk about a particular problem that comes to mind as a burning scenario or a situation, especially in these um, trying times of COVID uh, and all of the uh, setbacks that we have each seen within our lives. The youth of uh, today will face an extremely difficult challenge coming into a competitive marketplace already and have to re-engineer and rework their path uh, to their uh, future. Working towards their college acceptance or choosing the correct program uh, to find the internships and develop proper skills to earn the opportunities to prove themselves to be the right fit for the right job has become quite challenging. And today we have more than 1.2 billion young people between the ages of 15 and 24 years coming into the uh, population looking for those jobs. In 2030, this uh, projected number is going to go up by almost 7% to 1.3 billion. So you have to be a superstar to be able to situate and land yourself both socially and economically. So having said that or shared that, I'd like to ask a question of Professor Serapio. You have witnessed firsthand all of the struggles that the students face in the university. Can you describe the situation you are witnessing and possible opportunities that the students can leverage uh, to be able to fit into this um, difficult uh, time and scenario. Thank you, Rupa, and, and thank you for inviting me to serve in this panel. To your question, uh, these are complicated and challenging times. Uh, our students face many challenges, but let me just address two specifically. Uh, first, uh, many of our students now are asking this question, how is the pandemic going to impact their chosen field of study or their majors? For example, I direct the International Business Program and our students uh, ask the question whether globalization is really in retreat 
there's a slowdown in international trade and foreign direct investment, and even international travel. Will I have a job after I finish my program? Will I be able to continue doing what I love doing and the very reasons why I chose to study international business? You know, as the director of this uh, international business program at CU Denver, I've been hearing these questions more and more you know, in light of the current situation. You know, the second uh, issue or challenge or worry that we've been hearing from our students has to do with, uh, again, the transition that we're experiencing because of COVID to a virtual and remote world. The global pandemic has turned the world of study and work, you know, upside down. And they say that virtual and remote may be, you know, the new normal. So students are asking, how do I perform under these conditions? And how can I continue to be motivated given that the exciting stimuli have been, have been removed, you know, by the pandemic? You know, in fact, these are not just issues facing students. Uh, it, it faces faculty and our staff as well. I'll get back to your second question in terms of how do we leverage this and reconcile it and turn this into opportunities you know, later on. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and just to uh, kind of add additionally to it, uh, what are some of the opportunities uh, that the students can leverage uh, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, current times? There is plenty of children and students and youth of uh, today's uh, school and college system that are uh, coming up with extremely high GPAs or high scores. Acad academically, they're doing really well. What do you think uh, are some of the other uh, avenues that they can venture out on or uh, supplement their academic learning uh, to be able to fit into the job market. Yeah. You know, we, um, in our programs, we rely a lot on learning by doing, uh, something that we call, you know, action learning. You know, this has been very, very beneficial for many of our students, you know, to enhance their learning and enhance, you know, their preparation. So this is one thing uh, that, uh, I think will be very useful for students to focus attention to. And in our programs, we have built in these opportunities in courses that we offer, in consulting projects that students can do. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right, Brett, uh, going over to you. Um, on an average, each corporate job offer, um, job posting, let me say, uh, has about 250 resumes at minimum that comes in, and out of which four to six uh, candidates may be interviewed for that position to land that one job that is out there. So extremely com uh, competitive out there. So from your vast experience of what goes on behind the scenes and the product solutions that you're putting out to market, what would your thoughts be or what would your perspective be in terms of uh, different uh, organizations um, uh, hiring and uh, what would uh, the students or uh, the applicants uh, need to do to be able to land those interviews and place themselves with a job? So, you know, in my, in my role at, at Oracle, I have the opportunity to talk with, uh, you know, hundreds if not thousands of different uh, hiring organizations, whether they be government entities, whether they be universities that are hiring for their own staff or corporations. And as a, a, a member of this uh, kind of marketplace for the last uh, 20 plus years at this point, I've, I've definitely seen a, a pretty dramatic uh, change and shift in the way that organizations are, are hiring and the way that they think about finding the best talent. If I were to think back at you know, what was happening 15 or 20 years ago when organizations were shifting literally off of uh, paper resumes and, and <laughs> file cabinets full of information and shifting that to online spreadsheets and you know, just bringing it into a digital age to where they are now really shifting the processes that they use and the data that they have at their disposal to really understand their hiring decisions, the, the shift has been pretty dramatic. 
And I think the good news is, is that many organizations that I speak with are, are really aggressively shifting to more what I'll call skill-based hiring. So those of us that might not have the, uh, you know, the most prestigious pedigree, you know, we haven't gone to the finest universities, we don't have internships from the, you know, best companies in the world, um, you know, our prior experience maybe is something that, uh, you know, maybe everybody would know about. Organizations are really realizing that the best talent that they bring in don't necessarily have to have that, that background. Now, that may be a background that is absolutely beneficial, but the way that you get the skills that are absolutely critical in this modern marketplace sometimes don't come from the most expected places. So we see many organizations really thinking about it in that way and they're, and they're deploying technology to be able to find those types of, of individuals. So I think that's very, very positive in its own regard that this kind of shift towards skill-based hiring is, is definitely a, a reality. And I'm not saying that every organization is there yet, but I would say that the vast majority that I speak with are very much focused on um, understanding that level of information from their applicant pool. So if you're thinking that, oh, if I don't have, you know, this company on, on my, my resume or CV, or I haven't gone to this university, organizations are really looking at ways, and it's in, in really incumbent in, uh, at the personal level to figure out ways to communicate the skills that you do have and to really rely confidently that even if you gain those skills in kind of non-traditional ways, that they still have an incredible amount of value. And the other positive thing that we're seeing is that a lot of organizations are focusing on the candidate and the applicant experience very heavily. So as we all know, as part of this digital transformation that we're seeing in the marketplace, we're also noticing that many organizations are becoming keenly aware that their employment brand has a direct impact to their consumer brand. So the days of, oh, if I don't hire you, you don't really matter to me. Well, many organizations are realizing that if you don't have a good experience when you apply to a job at my company, if you're ever in the market to purchase products or services from my organization, that's going to really impact the way that you view my organization. So thinking about ways that you know, companies are really trying to, to better the experience, uh, better the type of information that gets shared with individuals, and making that really part of their process is extremely um, uh, prevalent in, in the market right there. Uh, and many organizations are really, really thinking about that very, uh, very deeply. So, you know, at the, at the end of it, I'm, I'm definitely seeing a lot of organizations that are focused on a better experience, helping applicants really understand, even if they didn't get a job, what were some of the reasons why? Making sure that they're kind of tapped into the process because it, it really is impactful to their business. And, um, you know, the shift towards skill-based hiring definitely is something that we're seeing. And, um, you know, I think it's an encouraging outcome to really increase the diversity and the different types of perspectives that organizations are trying to bring into their companies or uh, uh, nonprofit organizations. Uh, Brett, uh, I have a follow-up question to uh, the uh, detail that you've shared with us, which is extremely useful. What do you think uh, different companies are doing uh, to uplift the community and bring diversity into their workforce? Yeah, so, so diversity is, is definitely, um, again, kind of part and parcel to what we've been talking about, that organizations are really starting to identify that top talent doesn't necessarily come from the most traditional places. And now organizations have the data to back that. So 15, 20 years ago, they were going on intuition. Well, now fast forward a couple of decades, and they can really look at the information. They can look at who their top performers were, where they came from. And myself, I, I uh, hire a lot of product managers, and I can tell you they come from all different types of educational and experience backgrounds. And because of that, I know now not to look at a certain type of mold for my best individuals. I really want to look at a, at a diverse skill set, and I'm seeing more and more of that within organizations as well. So they're doing things within their organizations to try and really emphasize and, and use technology, again, to try to make this uh, kind of happen and, and remove some of the bias that oftentimes have, have really been discouraging for a lot of the, uh, the applicant pool. 
So you're seeing organizations really uh, think very closely about the the advertisements, you know, what they're putting out on the on the web and on their career sites, to make sure that they're not using language that implicitly is is biased and really um, you know prevents certain individuals from thinking that this might be an opportunity for them. Conversely, they're also seeing that, uh, you know, the implicit bias that a lot of organizations have is difficult to ferret out. So they're, they're really looking at things to, to kind of uh, massage different pieces of information that might be personally identifiable to kind of prevent those from being front and center during the initial parts of the selection process. And this is something organizations are taking very, very seriously to ensure that the applicant pool they're getting is actually getting a fair chance with uh, the hiring managers that are actually making the decision. So they're deploying technology, they're deploying business processes to really ensure that these different things are not preventing some of those um, kind of uh, top talent from finding their way through the process for some kind of you know, irrational uh, uh, reasons that they might, might have gotten pushed away uh, previously. Thank you so much, Brett. So uh, Shekhar, um, I think uh, you have taken uh, your professional success in the business um, marketplace and dedicated efforts to helping uh, the uh, underprivileged uh, under, uh, or uh, uh, the underserved communities and bring them into success, working with waste pickers um, in India. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, this um, uh, exciting opportunity that you have embarked on and how you are empowering uh, these folks uh, with uh, the economic success and stability that uh, they are looking for. When we talk about when we talk about youths looking at what are the opportunities out there, I think one of the big opportunities is in terms of being able to to look at the societal challenges that we have as a society uh, worldwide and def definitely in developing countries, and that's what we have been trying to do here how to bring business and operational rigor to a social justice issue and an economic justice issue uh, for marginalized communities like gray speakers and create business models that give them equal access, or equitable access to markets and opportunities, right? Uh, for livelihood, for entrepreneurship and so on. So for example, we have created a business model where we empower waste picker entrepreneurs uh, to, uh, to actually provide services, professional services uh, to uh, uh, large clients and uh, an act, a market that they otherwise couldn't access. So, uh, so basically you're trying to bring business rigor, operational rigor to a societal uh, issue. Uh, and uh, that is what we are trying to do here at Hasrudala Innovations. Uh, where we provide waste management services uh, to bulk generators of waste, to event hosts, and also to uh, brands like The Body Shop. Great, thank you. Um, how do you uh, go through the process of bringing uh, these folks into the fold of the program? Uh, obviously, they are, have been uh, many a generation that they feel that they are uh, coming into poverty and staying in poverty. So it needs a special um, set of um, advisory uh, perspectives uh, to be shared with them to bring them out and uh, show them new opportunity. I think uh, the, the basic thing, whenever you're working with marginalized communities is how do you, how do you earn their trust mm -hmm. that, uh, uh, that what you're trying to do with them uh, and uh, provide opportunities for them is something that you have no agenda in, right? Uh, as an organization, as an individual. So a lot of work has to go into the grassroots organizing where you have people uh, earning that trust over time by showing that you are there to provide windows of opportunities that they have to take up. See, finally, you can only provide access to opportunities. The hard work has to be done by them uh, because, uh, you know, charity is just going to go so far. Uh, it, can, it can address a particular situation like the pandemic or the lockdown, for example. But 
It cannot be what, uh, so you have to give them and, and, and make them also confident that they have the ability to go past their circumstances. Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, that leads me on to um, the next question or it totally segues me into the question that I'd like to ask all of you three panelists. Um, what are some of the career helps or programs that are out there um, for mentoring and being able to identify your own self-worth that you may be aware of? Uh, let's start with uh, uh, Professor Serapio. At uh, the University of Colorado, Denver, two years ago, we started the program. It's a mentorship program where our goal was to make sure that all of our students have a faculty advisor and a business mentor. We didn't know at the time that the current situation that we're in today will, will happen, but we're very glad that the, we did this because it's very timely and very, very helpful you know, for our students. So the students take advantage of this opportunity to have an ongoing conversation you know, with their mentors about various things, their professional journey, their personal interests, you know, other areas of interest. Uh, so uh, this has been extremely helpful you know, for them. So I going back to what I shared with you as the two challenges and how this mentorship program, you know, has helped, you know, these, these students. Uh, if I may, uh, uh, for example, the, the concern about uh, international business students, you know, having jobs in their, in a chosen field of study. And so the students will come to us and ask us to try and predict the future, you know, what will happen, you know, in the field. And so what we tell them, or what we suggest to them is it's, it's really very difficult today or these days. But instead of trying to predict the future so that you can control it, what we emphasize is what about controlling the future so that you don't have to predict it. And so to the point made earlier by you know, Brett about the importance of skills. So what we tell our students is that this probably is a good opportunity for them to upskill you know, to learn those skills that will become very, very important as international business transitions, for example, to a digital, global, disrupted, you know, economy. So, for example, having them study more about global e-commerce and, you know, global supply chain. Excellent. Thank you. Over to Brett. Yeah. Hey. So I'm probably less familiar with uh, kind of formal programs around mentoring, but what, what I did want to share is, is just some of the, um, I think, good uh, best practices that at least I know I go through with uh, some of my uh, mentee relationships, and, and I know many of my, my colleagues do in kind of a, a more kind of informal type setting. And, and really, it, it kind of builds on this concept of, of skill framing. So there's the not, not just the development of skills, but it really is the translation of the experiences that you have that, again, might be unexpected in the types of skills that they develop. And especially for, for you know, individuals that are early in their, in their careers or just starting their careers, there are many things that uh, may be unexpected that uh, are, are really fantastic opportunities. I mean, one of them that comes to mind is, is around volunteering opportunities. Mm -hmm. Many think, oh, it's got to be formal internships. It has to be actual paying jobs or formal education. But even volunteering opportunities are a great way to develop skills even if you're not getting paid in public facing ways, you're, you're gaining the ways of communication, you're gaining skills that, that really can help you in your career and being able to use that not just as a single line item on, on, a, on a resume or CV, but really being able to extrapolate what those skills are and be able to effectively communicate what you gained in those experiences. And I think that's one thing that, uh, you know, in that type of mentoring relationship that you can really try to kind of help, um, you know, ferret that out, make sure that, that you know, um, uh, whoever you're kind of talking with can help you translate some of those things. Because really having the confidence to stand behind those skills that you developed, even if they were developed in kind of non-traditional means, are very, very important to getting your foot in the door and setting you on a path. 
The other big thing that uh, I know I really focus on when, when I'm working with, with mentees is, is also around then um, setting that, that career path. And, and again, this is something that oftentimes is, is overlooked that sometimes where you ultimately want to get often takes kind of a circuitous route. It, it, it's not a, a direct linear um, set of stepping stones that you kind of work through. But again, different types of skills can be gained, even if they may seem kind of orthogonal to where you're really wanting to go. So making sure that you kind of um, really are, are talking and thinking about those, those things with your mentor can really ensure that you're getting the most out of that relationship. Fantastic. That's a great perspective. And over to you, Shaker. I think, uh, you know, a, men a mentor is a great, uh, uh, great person to have in your life. Uh, and you have to find mentors from among people that you are, uh, uh, that, that you're comfortable with, right? And what, what do you really want to expect from a mentor? You want, to, uh, you want him or her to be able to help you arrive at that intersection of what you're good at, what you're passionate about, and what the market will pay uh, for, and try and get to that intersection so that you really enjoy what you're doing. A lot of times, I think uh, our youth get, get taken up by what is the highest paying job, or what is uh, the one that gives me the most fame, or things like that, but I think at the end of the day, they should, be, they should be taking help in identifying what will they enjoy the most doing for the rest of their lives. And I think that is where a mentor tends to help uh, a lot. The second, I think, is our formal education systems are very good in terms of skill building, competence building, uh, knowledge in general, but are not the best in terms of uh, of giving you what I call your EQ, right, or emotional intelligence. And today's world, I think, just as much as uh, as knowledge and science, whatever you know is required, competency is required to do a job. I think equally important to succeed today is your ability to navigate relationships, teamwork, collaboration. And how do you get to something as quickly as you can? Uh, so, so innovation, all of that is, I think, a, a mindset and a way of thinking that a mentor can help you develop uh, uh, or while working with you. So those are some of the things that I would look for. And one last thing that I would say is uh, to all the youth, don't just look at a job, look at entrepreneurship also as a career option. Great. Thank you so much. That was very insightful. Um, I'd like to kind of ask one last question of the three of you. And you are uh, each very successful in what you have achieved through your careers and uh, through your uh, enterprise uh, uh, in, at large. What I'd like to hear from each of you is who has been that one mentor uh, that has pivoted uh, you uh, with your decisions and uh, taken you where you are and the importance of that mentor in your life. So let's start this time with uh, Shaker, uh, if you could uh, share that with us, please. I would say it was actually one of my uh, classmates from engineering uh, who, uh, who uh, I spent five years with in the, in the same hostel in the same wing who helped me figure out what is it that I think I would be good at. And he also became one of my bosses at IBM uh, a little later on. Uh, and uh, I think, I think what, what he truly helped me achieve was clarity of, of what is it that I would enjoy doing the most. Uh, and um, it took me some time to get there. You know, uh, it's not that I, uh, I, we got there quickly or I, uh, but I think that is, that is something that he truly helped me do. And, and that's why I keep harping on this, that what a mentor should truly be able to do for you is arrive at that uh, thing. And, uh, and definitely, you know, uh, his, uh, the opportunities he gave me, the networks he 
uh, uh, connected me to you all helped in getting to where I am today. Excellent. Networking is important yeah. and that's yes. uh, really a good key piece to remember. Thank you, Shekhar. Going over to you, Brett. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of in the same boat. I, uh, you know, had many mentors over the over the years, and and some of which, you know, take on uh, stronger roles at different points in my in my career. But I'd say that the commonality between them is is really their ability to connect with me in in my place, and to really um, encourage me to struggle with the comfortable and to be okay with that and to really kind of flesh out what it is that I'm, I'm, I'm really trying kind of struggling with, whether it's work-life balance, whether it's uh, career achievement, whether it's some other uh, life choice that might be going on and really to, to help me distill that down at the, at the pertinent moments as to what's really most important and to help me kind of balance the, the confidence and the ability to be humble and to kind of view situations with, with truly an open heart to absorb, you know, what the right decision is and, and not to be too kind of, you know, proud and, uh, you know, bold in, in how you're kind of approaching things, but to also balance that with, with humility. And I'd say that's kind of a, a common theme. And sometimes you need to hear that in different ways from different people at different points in your life. And I, I, I would kind of end with the fact that you should not be shy about asking for that help and for uh, inquiring with individuals that you value their opinion to formally take on that, that mentor relationship. You'll be surprised how many people um, either want to take that on or really want to help you find that right person. And so uh, uh, d definitely be sure to ask because there's more people than you would expect and want to help. Excellent. Thank you. And over to you, Dr. Uh, Professor. Yeah, and same with me. It's hard to uh, you know, choose one, but uh, let me just highlight you know, a couple, you know, starting you know, with, my, with my parents and uh, two of my faculty advisors in my graduate studies at the University of Illinois and also you know, at the University of Hawaii. A commonality uh, among these mentors uh, has to do with them teaching me the importance of lifelong learning. You know, it's, it's value and it's impact and how important it is to be always continuously you know, learning. And one of the quotes that uh, stuck with me uh, you know, because of this is actually a quote from you know, Gandhi, you know, who said that, live as if you were die to die tomorrow, learn as if you were to live forever. And so I think that hits that point about the importance of long-term, lifelong learning. And then secondly, you know, my, my wife, who was my business partner, uh, you know, early on, uh, you know, as an uh, academic, uh, you know, the things that uh, she has taught me has been very, very valuable. For example, don't overthink things. You know, you should have the courage, you know, to take risks and be very practical. So it's very important in my world, you know, to, to balance both. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Professor. So to kind of close, um, here at uh, Touch a Life uh, with the career health program that I have uh, initiated uh, as the chief evangelist, I have broken out uh, the entire career health into four pivotal pieces. One is, um, college onboarding or uh, people, uh, kids from the high schools or the school system that are heading towards the college programs, giving them information on uh, what would be a good fit for them, what are opportunities out there other than your engineers, your doctors and your teachers, um, which is uh, traditionally the three or four uh, areas of career that people look at. The second um, uh, is the career pivots. So as you get into your positions, and a lot of you mentioned, uh, they are uh, trying to discover what is the best fit. And uh, Shekhar uh, had alluded to uh, being able to identify who you are, what you would be best suited for uh, from an objective observer uh, is a great opportunity to be able to uh, get your uh, footing in the right direction. Uh, to actually speak about my own career, um, 
uh, I had a college degree with psychology, English, and journalism. And now I am leading the programs and release management teams of a software uh, applications team. So completely different from what I was educated with. It's the experience, the exposure, and the opportunity that you um, get onto or uh, are able to see uh, in your own lives uh, and be introduced to with mentors around you that can make a difference. The third piece is a social enterprise. And again, uh, going back to what Shaker said, um, we have the opportunity to become entrepreneurs. This uh, generation can look at the various digital transformations that are occurring uh, in the marketplace. And Brett and uh, both Professor Serapio also talked about uh, the various um, opportunities that COVID has brought or uh, the changing times has brought uh, to the marketplace. So social entrepreneurship is something that uh, we will absolutely be able to help you with. And the last but not the least is the entire influence of mentors. Mentors, be it just for your um, confidence boosting in terms of uh, looking at uh, an uh, doing a mock interview before you get out to that job interview. Or is it uh, something that you want to kind of look at from a different set of eyes or a fresh perspective on your resume? Uh, or is it uh, some of the problems that you're facing within your organization and um, want to talk it out with mentors out there? as a sounding board to any of the opportunities. So these are the four pivots that uh, we would um, offer at Touch Alive. And um, we just need you to go to touchalife.org slash career health and register yourself to be a mentor or a mentee. And we will reach out to you to be able to get you started on this new journey at Touch Alive. Before I close, I'd like to take a minute to go through the three panelists to see if there are any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our um, uh, community at large today. Uh, let's start with uh, Brett this time. Yeah, um, thanks for the opportunity to, to share my perspective. Um, you know, I think it's a great organization and, uh, you know, really encourage individuals to really kind of think, think differently, be, be proud and confident in what you're what you're trying to do and uh, organizations are, are are wanting people like you so taking the initiative you know uh, grasping mentor relationships and 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 really putting your your uh, you know foot forward definitely uh, uh, is a great step there's a lot of people that want to want to help if you're uh, not too shy to, shy to ask so thanks again <laughs> for the time thank you so much Brett over to you thank you very much for you know the opportunity uh, let me commend you what you're doing at uh, you know uh, Tal Touch Alive, uh, you're leveraging you know a high tech platform, uh, you know to do something that you know over the years has been really you know very personal and high touch. You know combining the two, and in the process, I think you've uh, provided an opportunity to scale mentorship and to cross borders and cross distances. So again, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, lastly, but not the least, Shekhar. Yeah, uh, thank you again for the opportunity. Uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, what, what Touch Your Life is doing is, is something really great because I think in, in these trying times, especially uh, trying, to, trying to find people who can give you a sense of direction, a sense of, uh, a sense of hope, uh, a sense of confidence, uh, all of that, uh, is is something that is absolutely necessary, and you are truly uh, addressing that. Uh, so thank you for doing that. And uh, my my last thought to all of you who are looking at what to do in life, uh, just like uh, Rupa said, where she started from and where she ended up are way different. Uh, this a little goes for me too. I mean, I started off as a corporate. Uh, sales and marketing guy for 23 years, pivoted to being a professor of marketing. And now I'm a social entrepreneur in waste management of which I knew nothing about. Uh, so, so as Brett said, where, where you need to get to is not necessarily a linear straight path. It can be sometimes a circuitous route to where you finally 
uh, uh, land and where you want to be. So, so, uh, so go out there, experiment. Uh, don't uh, don't think that anything is is less than what it should be uh, uh, at any point of time. So, all the best to uh, all of. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to just take this opportunity once again to thank each one of you for having spent the time with me and uh, sharing some extremely simple yet effective nuggets for people out there to try, listen, and reach out to Touch a Life. So thank you once again and uh, goodbye. <laughs>